For individuals ages 14 to 44, it is the second leading cause of death. And so what that means is that suicide causes more death than homicide here in the United States, than for people 14 to 44 at least, than cancer, than heart disease or other physical ailments. And then now we'll start, try to build a stage. So we'll start with uh, uh, what is the prevalence of a mental health issue in the U.S. and in the world? Yeah, so globally, the, the prevalence of mental health concerns are surprising. Here in the United States, for example, during a person's lifetime, about 50% of Americans will meet diagnostic criteria for some mental disorder, depression or anxiety, substance use disorder, et cetera. So about 50% or just under 50% will meet criteria for one of those. So it's, it's a shockingly prevalent concern and, and one that we're working very hard to try and figure out. Wow, that's, a, that's astonishing, I haven't imagined. So basically one in two have a, a, a mental health issue. And I assume that most of us or most of the people that have it, it's undiagnosed, so it's going under the carpet in a way. Yeah, so we think that's that's likely true. That, that, that you know, yes, fifty percent of people who are walking around on the street right now may or may may currently or at some point in their life have met criteria for a disorder, but the vast majority of those aren't known to mental health professionals and likely are not seeking help that they might benefit from. Yeah, and what is the prevalence for suicide? Yeah, suicide is uh, particularly concerning in terms of its prevalence. So uh, around 49,000 Americans died by suicide last year. And to put that kind of number into perspective, that's about double the capacity of our uh, Madison Square Garden here in New York City, where I live. So that number is obviously concerning. But there's a considerable more, a considerably higher number of people who have attempted suicide, numbering over a million each year here in the United States, and countless more are thinking about suicide. So it, it's a tremendous concern from a public health perspective, and one that the CDC, for example, has generated a, a fairly broad call to action around, both in terms of increasing our research productivity around understanding suicide, as well as developing new interventions that will help people who are at risk. So, so one million people uh, attempted suicide in a year, but only around 50,000 succeed. So basically only 5% of the population that tried to suicide actually succeed. That's the statistic? Yeah, that's, that's probably about, about right. So it's, it's about one, if I remember correctly, about one, between 1 1.4 and 1 1.7 uh, suicide attempts. Uh, but the difference in the way that we count suicide attempts versus the way we count suicide deaths is very different. Suicide deaths are often determined by a medical examiner or coroner uh, when they are uh, examining um, potential cause of death. Uh, whereas for uh, suicide attempts, sometimes those might be reported through statistics that occur in hospital settings, but they're also often self-reported. And so that could also be an underestimate in some ways. Yeah. And uh, as you know, we, we focus on longevity and health span. So what is the effect of uh, mental health and suicide on health span and lifespan? Well, it's tremendous. The reality is that because suicide uh, is such a prevalent concern in the United States, it's in fact, across all age groups, the 10th leading cause of death for Americans. For individuals ages 14 to 44, it is the second leading cause of death. And so what that means is that suicide causes more death than homicide here in the United States, than for people 14 to 44, at least than cancer, than heart disease or other physical ailments. It's second to accidents that occur in people's lives. And so, as I mentioned earlier, it's a tremendous public health concern. And we're really grappling with that in terms of ways to better understand when and where and why suicide might happen so that we can intervene. But in terms of the impact that suicide can have on a person's life, it's tremendous. Now, uh, mental health concerns are obviously a risk factor for suicide and mental health concerns broadly are something that reduce quality of life, that change the way that people interact socially, that change the way that people access the outdoors or seek medical care when they need it. And so there are really important ways that 
mental health concerns can impact people's health in ways that also impact longevity. Yeah, sounds like that. And I assume that uh, COVID uh, had even uh, worsened the, uh, the, the statistic on uh, a suicide and mental health problem. Can you discuss that? Well, so the, the data suggesting, data pretty clearly suggests that mental health concerns overall did increase since the start of, su- since the start of uh, COVID-19. Suicide, however, has been harder to pin down. During the early part of COVID, there was some data that suggested suicide actually reduced slightly, but then may have uh, increased somewhat rapidly from 2021 to 2022. And maybe that was a delayed effect due to some of the concerns that were going on in COVID that I'm happy to talk about. But there's no doubt that COVID, from a psychological perspective, was incredibly challenging for people here in the United States and around the world. And I think one of the biggest reasons was because it fundamentally changed the social landscape of our lives. We are no longer attending work in person. We're doing work by Zoom. We are no longer going to doctor's visits in person. We're often doing those via telehealth or, or some, some similar digital means. And so it's really changed the way that we interact with others and may also have led to people feeling incredibly isolated, which is a vulnerability factor for mental health concerns across the board and suicide. Yeah, so if we are uh, trying to think about intervention, it sounds like what I'm hearing from you is try to go more to work, try to go to your physician uh, meeting, uh, try to go and buy the uh, grocery at the uh, supermarket and uh, don't use Instacart because we need this interaction and uh, living on Zoom is not enough. That's a fair uh, statement. What I would say is that I think it's really important for people to be able to have opportunities for interactions with others. And there are lots of benefits that many of us have had during COVID-19 for, in terms of the transition from in-person activities to Zoom-based activities, for example. It gives you more flexibility with your time, shorter commutes, et cetera. And so I wouldn't say across the board that we should avoid these kinds of things. What I think is important is that if we're doing a lot of our activities through digital means like Zoom, that we find other ways that, to make sure that we're connecting with people in real life, but also potentially through these digital channels as well. The idea is we want to make sure that people have a supportive and close social network. And there's actually lots of ways that we can do that, even including the internet. 